Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Chad Kalick, and welcome back to the In a Credit Room podcast for episode number 48, which we are going to talk about the crossroads. Now, when I say the crossroads, I am inspired to speak about this because I saw the movie The Crossroads was on really late last night. And this is the movie with Ralph Macchio where he plays a guitar player from New York City. He meets a blues guitar player named Willie Brown, who sold his soul to the devil at the crossroads, in which Ralph Macchio wants to go have a guitar duel with the devil's guitar player, who's actually played by Steve Vai, the former guitar player for David Lee Roth, in which Ralph Macchio wins back Willie Brown's soul in this guitar uh, battle, I guess you could say. And this whole story is actually inspired by what some say is a true story, what some say is a legend of a real blues guitar player named Robert Johnson, who at the height of his popularity, it was 1937 or 1938, uh, he just kind of disappeared off the map. And it's believed that there are still a couple albums that have never been released of his material. But Robert Johnson is considered the father of the Delta Blues. But it's also believed that he was the original guitar player who wound up at a crossroads where he met the devil. And in exchange for his soul... He was given fame and fortune as a musician. And that was the deal that was made. You give me your soul, and I'll give you all your dreams. Again, some say this is legend and lore. Some say this is true, and it's been happening for a long time. And what made me wonder if it is true is how many different references there have been over the years about deals being made with the devil for fame. Most recently, I was listening to the Aaron Lewis song, Country Boy, since he's gone country and has this buddy new career as a country artist. But in the song Country Boy, he says, it's been 12 years since I sold my soul to the devil in L.A., he said, sign your name here on the dotted line and your songs they all will play. He set up shop on Sunset. He put me up at the marquee. He said, you want to sell a million records, boy? You better listen to me. Change your style. Whiten your smile. You could lose a couple pounds. If you want to live this life, you better lose that wife. Do you need your friends around? Now, once again, these lyrics are referencing him obviously giving up everything in his life that's, you know, comfortable to him and good for him. Everything that steers him in the right path. Lose your wife, lose your friends, you know, starve yourself, get your fake white teeth, you know, do all this to sell records. And he says it's been 12 years since he sold his soul. So he is saying that he did the deal. Now, many different artists over the years, like I said, have claimed this. Bob Dylan, for example, claimed many times when he was younger that he made a deal with the devil. In fact, I found this interview he did in which he states the following when asked by the interviewer, why are you still out here? Dylan says, it goes back to that destiny thing. I made a bargain with it, you know, a long time ago. And I'm holding up my end. He's referring to Los Angeles, by the way. The interviewer asks, what was your bargain? Bob Dylan says, to get where I am now. The interviewer asks again, should I ask who you made the bargain with? Bob Dylan says, with the chief commander. The interviewer asks, on this earth? And Dylan says, in this earth and in the world we can't see. Clearly, he's not referencing God at this point. And there's a lot of other celebrities and artists that people believe made deals with the devil. Justin Bieber is one. Britney Spears, Jay-Z, 
Matthew McConaughey, Jim Carrey. These careers do follow in a really bizarre path in the sense that these people explode out of the box and just seem to reach the highest of highs in such a short amount of time and it's usually followed by some kind of meltdown and then some kind of religious experience where they seem to be wanting to erase something. Uh, the most recent one that I can think of is Justin Bieber. He has a spiritual advisor that is uh, leading him all around town and uh, there's videos of Bieber taking over small parties and like weddings that he's at and singing all these Christian songs. Um, for a while, Snoop Dogg had a spiritual advisor running around town with him uh, that went everywhere he went. You know, when Britney Spears had her meltdown and was shaving her head and uh, got lost in the drugs for a minute and lost her kids. You know, a lot of people believe this is because she was trying to basically hedge on her deal that she made. I've mentioned this before on the podcast because it's so hard to make it in this business. I mean, it's hard to just get a job, you know, as a production assistant, you know, a freaking nobody on set, uh, much less, you know, conquering the entertainment business at the age of 15, you know, it's almost unheard of. So when it happens, I think part of it is the fascination. People go, wow, how could that happen? Because it's a great question. How could that fucking happen when the industry is just built to keep people out? Um, so, yeah, I think there's a natural uh, you know, desire to believe that there's something extra that made this happen. That the stars just don't align like that. So when they do... There has to be some kind of hand at play. But I still can't get over the seed to the tree, right? I've said this before, too. Whenever there's a legend or lore that's huge, there is usually a seed. Something, something fantastic that happens. Something incredible that got later blown up into an even bigger story. You know, where did this story come from of Robert Johnson meeting the devil at the crossroads? I mean, this story did not exist before him. That's what I find really powerful. Before Robert Johnson, there were many musicians, many that were successful. But for some reason, this story... The genesis of the Crossroads Devil story started with Robert Johnson. And since Robert Johnson, it's been repeated many, many times. You know, right down to the Rolling Stones, you know. Please allow me to introduce myself. I'm a man of wealth and taste. And that's where these images came from of the devil being a suave dresser and, uh, you know, somebody who is not monstrous looking, but somebody who is uh, highly attractive and slick. You know, that's how the devil is described in Robert Johnson's Crossroads story and in many other stories. So I've often wondered... You know, did Aaron Lewis actually meet somebody who said, I will make you a deal? You can have whatever you want in this lifetime. But I get your soul when it's over. Did Robert Johnson really meet the devil and did he do the same? You know, when I first learned about this story, I was very young. I was 10 years old as the Crossroads movie came out in 1986. And I was fascinated by this story. 
I was so fascinated by it. And when my brother started his first rock band, I literally wondered if they would ever be driving through the back country roads of Texas and if they would come to a crossroads and what would they say if they did. As I got a little older, I started to believe that it was just a story. That's all it was. You know, having said that, I'm going to tell you guys a story that is very personal. And I've went back and forth over the last few days as to whether or not I was going to share this story. But after thinking about it, look, I created this podcast to be honest with you guys. And just let the cards fall where they may and tell you the truth of my experiences. Just why it says this is a storyteller's podcast, so I'm going to tell you a really personal story that made me question as to whether or not this whole crossroads thing was real. When I was 19 years old, the summer, when I turned 19, right after college got out, a couple of my buddies decided to go down to Texas to visit some friends of mine. They were close family friends. I'm not saying their names and you'll understand why in a minute. So we called down and we asked them, you know, are you guys going to be around? Because we'd love to come see you. And they lived right on the ocean. And they said, sure, come on down. So I was so excited because I've said this before, Texas feels like home to me. I, I lived there until I was 12 before moving to Iowa, so Texas always just feels like my home. So I went down there, and we hooked up with our family friends, and hooked up with my buddy that I grew up with. And what was interesting is when I was younger, at the age of eight, my buddy's older sister, I'm just going to change her name here and call her Lindsay. She knows who she is. Uh, Lindsay is easy for me to remember, though. Lindsay was the first crush that I ever had. I was eight years old, and at that time, she was 20 years old. It was the first time that I really just saw a woman and went, wow, she is stunning. And I was a smitten little boy. And I had not seen her for, you know, a good 10 years. So upon arriving in Texas, I hear she's actually in town, in which at that time... I'm 19, and she is 31. I'm super excited to see her. I haven't seen her in a long time. And uh, I get a phone call saying that, yes, she's going to come hang out with us for a few days. And I'm like, wow, this is freaking cool. And she shows up, and we hit it off right away. I mean, we're just chatting up a storm, and my buddies are with me, and they're having a great time. And I come to find out that she's actually a dancer at this uh, this place called the Men's Club. Very, very high-end strip club where, like, all the professional athletes go there. Jeff Bagwell at the time, uh, Clyde Drexler. Like, a really high-end, five-star restaurant type of strip club. And because of that, she has, like I said, connections all over the city. And the reason this is important is because... Through our conversation, she says, do you like Pantera? They're in town. Well, if you know anything about my history, I was more than a fan. Like Phil Anselmo had changed my life. I mean, he's the reason I shaved my head. I mean, without even knowing it, I was emulating him. They were the most important band in the world to me. Like how more right could everything go right now? I come down to the place that I love that's home reconnect with this girl that was my first crush who is now this beautiful woman who is saying not only is she going to get tickets she knows like pantera so she's getting us backstage passes and i'm like you are kidding me so i'm incredibly excited and as it turns out she's only able to get two passes so my buddies can't go but she and I could go, which to be honest at that time, I'm perfectly happy to be selfish because I just, there's no way I'm going to miss 
meeting Pantera backstage. I, I, I couldn't even fathom what she was saying at that time. I was like, you have to be kidding me. Like, this is a dream come true. So we go to the show, and on the way to the show, I mean, we're having a blast. We're just chit-chatting it up and, you know, catching up and, and just discussing everything that's happened over the years. And we finally get to talking about the show, and I learned that Typo Negative is opening up. Type of negative at that time, second favorite band in the world. I'm like, okay, again, how many things can keep going right? I mean, this is incredible. We get there, and Lindsay and I are just having the time of our life. Uh, we start drinking right away. My fake is working everywhere. I had a fake ID at that time. It didn't even matter because once I got backstage, and you could have whatever you want. And if you know anything about Pantera, you know that they're all heavy drinkers. And uh, having an amazing time, just getting more and more drunk and buzzed throughout the night. The show is unbelievable. I mean, I just feel like I'm on cloud nine, you know? The show ends. The next thing I know, I'm in a, you know standing there talking to Phil Anselmo, talking to Dimebag Daryl, doing a sh uh, black tooth grin shot, which is a very famous shot that they created with uh with Vinnie Paul having an amazing time just I'm sitting there hanging out with the legends of my world at that time like the most important people the show gets over and I'm just so freaking happy and we're walking back to the car because we have to go pick my friends up and we get back to the car and I walk around to the passenger side and I look over my shoulder and I see that so is she. And she was driving. And I turn around and look at her. And I'm just like, wow. And I'm not going to go any further than that, but you get where this story's going. And again, I'm sitting here going, how many, <laughs> how many more? amazing things can go right in one setting and uh i'm floored so we go pick up my friends i'm telling them all about the show and i met dime and i met you know this this that and they all go to bed and then you know i spend the night with Lindsay. that night end up going out just partying like crazy. And for the first time in my life, I do the drug ecstasy. Mind blowing. Absolutely mind blowing. Probably had the single greatest night of my life. I mean, it was everything I could possibly imagine, you know, that I ever wanted to do as a young man it was all balled into these you know, three, four days, which at that time I knew this was unique because too many things were going right. And when I say going right, I mean, as a young man who wants to, you know, indulge in all of his vices and everything he loves, like everything was coming together and just stacking itself. You know, it's like, if I sat down and, and wrote, what do I want this experience to be? What would be the perfect experience? This was it. So you get the picture. But like all good things, they eventually end. And now it's time to go home. And that means it's time for me to come out of the drug-induced partying haze that I had been in for the better of a week. And this is all happening as I'm boarding a plane to fly back to Iowa. And when you come off ecstasy, your body just hurts so bad. You're so depressed. You're so sad. Your dopamine levels are just drained and you just feel like you want to walk off a bridge. And I had never experienced that before. I had never had any drugs before. This was really the first time that I had done anything hard, you know, beyond like smoking weed or something like that. And what was interesting is I was sitting next to this gentleman 
that was dressed in this solid blue suit. He almost looked like a pimp almost, but with more style, with more flash. And out of the blue, he just starts talking to me and he's like, oh no, I've seen that look before. I'm like, what's that? And he's like, you got the look of age. You did something that puts some age on you. I'm like, oh yeah, man, indeed I did. And you know, he's like, well, tell me all about it. Tell me about the pain. And I'm almost laughing inside because he's just dead on, you know? And I don't know why, but I ended up telling him like everything. And I think it's maybe because I was so depressed. I just needed somebody to talk to and it felt good, I guess, to talk to him about it. I mean, he's a stranger, right? Like, why would he give a shit, you know? And we talked almost the whole flight back. And I told him everything that every sin I could have ever wanted to indulge in, it was served up on a platter. But now that I'm coming back to the real world, I have this beautiful angel at home named Laura. And I'm trying to decide if I come home and just come clean and tell her everything. Or if I just don't say a word because she'd never know. And I don't think I could live with that. But I'm also certain I can't live with losing her. And I was waking up to what I did. And she didn't deserve it. She didn't do anything wrong. It was just me being young and stupid and just wanting to be selfish and have those experiences. And this guy's listening to me and you know, he says to me, you ain't figured it out yet. The world's one big illusion and it can be whatever you want it to be. Now I'm paraphrasing because I obviously can't remember every exact word that he said, but this was his point is that the world could be whatever you want it to be. He says, we well, haven't learned yet that everything you experienced only happened in your world. It didn't happen in your girlfriend's world. It's okay if you don't collide the two because they didn't naturally exist together anyways. And I'm like, this is just some funky shit way to tell me to lie, you know? And I said to him, well, I don't know about all that. What I know is I can't be around her and not tell her. Above all, she's my best friend. And I, just, I can't do that. I can't take that pain away. He said, if you can't take that pain away, all you have to do is ask somebody else to take it away. And I jokingly said, oh, like God, ask God to take away my cheating pain. And I'll never forget this. He paused and got this big toothy smile and said, well, something like that. And it just creeped me out. Because it felt like a proposition. It felt like he was saying, I could take it away. All you got to do is ask me. I told him I was good. And I'd figure it out. I ended up going to sleep. The next thing I know, I feel a hand on my shoulder. And it's a stewardess telling me that everybody else has deboarded the plane. And I need to get off. <laughs> so I did. I got off. I got in my car. I drove from Des Moines two hours to Laura, and I confessed everything to her. And she was hurt. And we broke up for a bit. Thankfully, we eventually worked it out. And believe me, there were times where I felt like, why did I tell her? You know, when we were broken up, I was like, why did I tell her? I didn't have to. 
but then it came back to that. I would live with that pain, and I don't know how to remove that pain. And I thought about what he said. Well, what if I could just ask somebody to remove it? What if the devil could take it away? Well, many years later, I'm in Los Angeles because I'm showcasing with my band, 35-inch Mutter. It's very late at night. It's about 3 in the morning. I'm really hungry. And Mel's Burger is just up the street from the Hyatt House. So I decide I'm going to go get a burger. I go by myself, walk a few blocks, walk in, get a burger and fries, completely alone. And I'm listening to this conversation behind me. And it's this guy basically talking about how they're going to kick their singer out of their band. And the reason it's going to hurt him so bad to do it is because his singer is his best friend and started the band with him. And he appears to be talking to his manager or somebody that's in a guidance role. You know? And at the very end of their conversation, this guy basically says, I can't do it, man. I, I just can't kick him out. He doesn't deserve it. I just can't do it. I don't know how people can live with that kind of betrayal, but I can't. That's my boy. That's my best friend. I can't do it. And again, I'm paraphrasing here. He's like, so my answer is no. And the guy that's speaking to him basically says, well, listen, you don't got to give me the answer now. Just take the night and pray on it and tell me tomorrow what you think. And he goes, pray on it. And he goes, yeah. He goes, so you want me to go home and pray to God and ask him if I should kick my singer out of my band? And the guy that's talking to him takes a long pause and says, well, something like that. And just gave me the fucking chills. Because I remember that same response that I had. Now, I don't know what that means. I don't know if that means that there is a devil out there making deals with people. But I know it made me feel some kind of way hearing that response. And it got me thinking that when referencing the demonic, basically what we're talking about is an intelligent manifestation of evil, right? Then we could take the tags away and just say that's what it is. But if it is truly an intelligent manifestation of evil, there's many ways to skin a cat, you know what I mean? Possession is one way to go about it. And that's freaking someone out and driving them crazy and oppressing them and doing all this overt, you know, powerful, aggressive things to take someone over who obviously has a rip somewhere in their soul and they just want to, you know, fight their way in and get them to ultimately kill themselves. That's one way to do it. Is it possible that not only does evil aggressively attack, but that it also works in cunning, clever ways. Because what is our lifetime compared to an eternity? If you gave someone 50 good years in the sun, what is that compared to an eternity? Why have so many artists referenced us? Why have so many artists had these breakdowns where suddenly they're grasping for spirituality. You know, the guy that spoke to me on the plane basically said to me, if you can't get this pain out of your heart, the devil can take it away. Without saying it, he's saying, how bad do you want it? How bad do you want this all to go away? All of your sins, you want them washed? Everything you did, you want them washed. And if this was what was going on behind me, basically that's what this managerial person was saying. He was saying, you want to get rid of your best friend? You want it not to hurt? Pray on it. Pray to who? God? Well, something like that. I don't know the answer to this, but I do believe in possession. And I just think that if possession is possible, then something like this is possible. And there's a reason why the crossroads story exists. 
And there's a reason why so many artists write about it. You know, when I think about it, I don't know if that was my crossroads or not. If it was, I hope I passed the test. And if I'm still to find my crossroads one day, I hope that I care about enough of the right things to pass the test then. But what I do know is that I'm glad I told Laura. I'm glad I went back as bad as that hurt and as shitty as that was. I'm glad that, you know, we had the chance to work it out. And I'm glad it was something we were able to put behind us. Because it taught me that in order to know what's right in this world, you have to feel what's wrong. You have to feel that pain. You have to feel that burn. And you have to know that you did it. That you were capable of hurting someone you love. Because that pain that he wanted to erase, that pain that he suggested somebody else remove from my chest, I need that pain. I need that pain. Because there is no better teacher than suffering. Thank you guys for listening to episode number 48 of the In a Crowded Room podcast. I'll be back tomorrow with more. All the best.